Welcome to Living Out of Suitcases. I'm Sean Rice from the international tour of the Adams Family, and this is my vlog, where I let you know all about the places that we're going on tour, show you some handy travel tips, and games that travel well on the road. We're just getting back into the swing of things here on tour. All the cast and the crew have arrived here in Binghamton, New York to start some tech rehearsals and then have some preview performances. The tech rehearsals are sort of when all the cast and the crew start practicing the show in little bits and pieces, but running basically the technical elements, the sound, the lighting, the special effects, that sort of thing. Then we'll have some audiences come in and we'll do some performances for them just to make sure everything's going right, and those are called our previews. It's a lot of work, but I did have some free time on my golden day that's actor speech for day off to go out and explore Binghamton. Binghamton is a quaint town in upstate New York. In fact, it looks like almost every other town I've been to, which is perfect because Binghamton is also the home of Rod Sterling, creator of the Twilight Zone. He was born and grew up here and there's plenty of memorabilia around, including here in Recreation Park. The carousel and the bandstand here were the inspiration for the episode Walking Distance, and they were featured in the episode when the story's main character comes in contact with himself as a young boy and takes a ride. Walking around Binghamton, you almost get the feeling that you're in the twilight zone because the town seems so quiet in the mornings, especially over here in the park. Now the carousel itself is something of a wonder. It's over 80 years old and absolutely beautiful. It's one of a 150 antique carousels that remain in the United States and Canada. In fact, there are six of them, including this one, here in the Binghamton area. Now, not only that, but in a world where nothing is free, you can take a ride in one of these carousels for just the price of a piece of litter. Now, they run from Memorial Day to Labor Day, so I've just missed being able to ride this one myself. But if you're in Binghamton in the spring and summer, go ahead and check it out. I've been living on the road for about five years now, and I've learned a few things about living out of a suitcase. So I wanted to share with you my four essential things for traveling on the road. These things will not only be lifesavers for you, but they're going to save you a lot of time and money as well. So the first thing every traveler should have is a luggage scale. Now most of my traveling is done by bus, but every once in a while we fly, and airlines they don't mess around when it comes to that 50 pound weight limit for your luggage. And when you live out of a suitcase, it's very easy to want to travel with more than 50 pounds worth of things. Every time that we fly, I'm use this guy to make sure that I'm not going to be charged overage fees because those can be astronomical. They even charge them if you're one pound over. Now what's great about this guy? He's electronic which means he's very, very accurate and he's very easy to use. All I have to do is attach him to my luggage, lift up on the handle, and then wait about 10 seconds. When I hear the beep, I put it down and it's gonna tell me on the scale exactly how much my luggage weighs. You don't wanna do this in the airport. If you wait till then, you'll be holding up a 300 mile long line while you're scrambling through your suitcase trying to move socks and underwears and books and back and forth between your suitcases. Not the ideal situation. An e-reader. Now this is my pride and joy. I am a big, big reader. And on my first tour, I was traveling across the country and I found myself going to Barnes Noble and buying books and buying books and they would add to my luggage weight and be bulky and hard to carry around and I'd be shipping stuff home, spending money on that. Um, so when the Kindle and the Nook were born, I took advantage of it. I can have hundreds of books or magazines or different kinds of reading materials in PDF format even on this e-reader and it's so easy to travel around. It weighs less than a pound. It fits into my suitcase, it fits into my bag, it fits into my coat pocket. The newer ones are HD, which means that you can download movies on there, you can stream Netflix, there are apps and games for it. It's a definite must have for anyone who reads. Kitchenware. I recommend picking up a large microwavable container that has a lid with for steam escaping, um, a, a simple silverware set, knife, fork, and spoon, and a bowl. Because let me tell you, when you want to even eat a bowl of cereal, you're in a hotel. Where are you going to find a spoon or a bowl? And finally, the most important thing that you should travel with you, a power strip. Sounds simple, right? But hotel rooms rarely have enough plugs for everything that you need to plug in. Think about it. You've got your computer, you've got your phone, you've got your e-reader, you've got your camera. And then let's say you have a roommate in the room like I do. He's got his phone, his computer, his camera. You're never going to be able to do it all at once. Sometimes you're not only lucky to have one plug in the room between you. 
Traveling to a different city every other day can be very hard, so I've come up with some different things that you can do to pass the time on your next journey. Now, I'm a very big reader, and so I'm very excited that we just started the Adams Family Book Club here on tour. In fact, it's our very first month, and we're starting our very first book right now. This month's book was suggested by Mark Poppleton, who plays Mal Beinecke, Wednesday's future father-in-law in the play, and my roommate. Uh, so I would like him to kind of introduce the book to us. Mark? Hey. Um, we are starting with Solo by William Boyd, which is a uh, James Bond film, a James Bond film, James Bond novel. Um, unlike the films, it's based more on the Ian Fleming series, which is, uh, he takes it right at the end of where Ian Fleming died and passed on. He takes, picks right up at 1969. James Bond's now 45 years old, and uh, it's his birthday, and he is being sent out to Africa to take care of some uh, misguided leader there. It's really, really cool. It's, um, if you've never read a James Bond book before, so far, it's very Ian Fleming-ish. It's dealing with his real raw character because James Bond isn't like a Superman like he is in the films. He's more of a real man. He's dealing with sexuality. He's dealing with nervousness. He's dealing with excitement over his case. He gets very excited about and very passionate about solving this crime or what's ever happening. Um, and it's very, like the films, he goes to exotic places. And it's fun to read about where he's going, and it's described beautifully. And William Boyd is a great, great writer so far. So, hope you enjoy it. If you are planning on reading along with us, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to know what you think about this new James Bond. This week, I want to highlight one of my favorite types of games in general, and of course, to take on the road. Cooperative games. Now, co-ops are great because instead of all the players working against each other, you're all working together actually to defeat the game itself, which means it works pretty well as a single player game too, you know, just in case you're the only gamer on the tour. This week's game is called Space Hawk Death Angel by Fantasy Flight Games. One to six players take control of a squadron of space marines that have been tasked with exploring a giant spaceship and clearing out the bug-like alien gene stealers that have infested it. It's kind of like having your own Aliens movie without Sigourney Weaver. Or that little girl. Get away from her, you bitch! I love that movie. What makes this game great for being on the road is it doesn't have a lot of components. It's basically a deck of cards, one die, and a couple of small tokens. It fits in this tiny box, and this fits easily into any suitcase, purse, carry-on that you're going to take with you. Here's what the game looks like when it's all set up. We have a line of our space marines here in a formation. Now it's kind of like they're walking down a very long corridor. And down the corridor there are specific terrain cards that show us what the terrain looks like within the hallway. Now on the terrain cards that's where our gene sealers can enter the game and wreak havoc for our space marines. Some of the terrain cards, like our door card here, have certain activities that can be activated during the game. At the top of our formation are our room cards. We have the current room that we're in and the other rooms that we have left to explore. Now the room card shows us what the terrain of the hallway looks like, as well as how many gene stealers can enter the room during this round. On the right and the left of our room cards are our blip piles. The blip piles represents the gene stealers that will enter the corridor while we're in this room. Once a blip pile has been emptied, then we move to the next room. Finally, at the very top are our event cards. Now the event cards act like the game's turn. They show us how many gene stealers enter the room during this space marine's turn, as well as give sometimes positive but mostly negative effects that will happen to our space marines. The game itself is played in four very fast phases. Now in the first phase, we're going to have three choices to make for our space marines. We're going to decide what actions they're going to take during this round. Now you have three choices. First is to attack gene stealers. Second is to move. Now that can mean moving up and down within the line, turning left and right to face different directions, or activating our special terrain cards. Finally, they can support. That will give our space marine a support token that he can use later in the game to re-roll a defense die or an attack die. 
In the second phase, all of the Space Marines will then carry out the actions that we've chosen for them. In the third phase, if there are any Gene Stealers left alive, they will then attack our Space Marines. And finally, in the fourth phase, we play an event card, and that is the game's turn. The game ends when one of two things happens. A, your Space Marines have all died. Or B, at least one of those Space Marines makes it to the last room and completes the task listed on there, which may be clearing out all the Gene Stealers or killing the Gene Stealer King. I'm not gonna lie. You only have a 44% chance of winning the game, and you'll probably have at least 86% casualties of your Space Marines. But in this kind of game, the fun isn't the winning, it's getting to the finish line. For more information about Space Hawk Death Angel, or to pick up a copy of your own, go ahead and check out Fantasy Flight's website at www.fantasyflightgames.com. Pugsley Adams, and I'd love if you'd follow me around the Adams family backstage area. This is Cat, our wardrobe mistress here at the Adams family. So, Cat, what do you do? Um, make sure that uh, all the costume changes go smoothly and wash your dirty clothes. Yeah, that sounds great. Have you ever pinched your hand with a sewing needle and had blood gush out of your hand? Uh, I don't know about gushing, but yes. <laughs> I've bled before. Does that help? Yes, it does. That sounds lovely. And what is your favorite costume? Uh, I can't say that I have a favorite costume. Um, I like all the ancestors because they're fun. All different. Mm -hmm. And who is your favorite Adams? Obviously, Pugsley is my favorite. Oh, good answer. So this is Britt, our wig mistress here at the Adams family. So Britt, what do you do? Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Absolutely. That's great. And what got you into wigs? Started doing wigs uh, back when I was in high school, actually. That's great. What's something fun about your job? I get to take straight razors to Brian. That sounds pretty Better fun. <laughs> and who is your favorite Adams? Pugsley, of course. Oh, Good answer. So this is Deb, our company manager. So Deb, what do you do? I manage the company, basically. It's a pretty um, involved job. I do everything from all the logistics, getting the company to and from one city to the next, making sure their hotel arrangements are all taken care of, uh, making sure there are restaurants and there are places for them to eat that stay open late, um, making sure that basic quality of life issues are satisfied and taken care of. That's one thing. I do human resources, meaning I help you guys get paid. I do all of the um, contracting. I make sure that all your contracts are administered appropriately. And then on top of that, I also do all the finances. So uh, anything from petty cash to any charges we make for the show, for the company, for travel, I also handle that as well. And a ton of other things I could barely even go into detail. I also, oh, this is important. I can't forget this. I am. Um, manage the contracts that we have with the theaters. So whenever we go into a theater, I meet with their reps and the presenters there, and we make sure everything from tickets to the show to front of house needs and all of that are taken care of as well. How boring. What's been your favorite stop on the tour? <laughs> I have to say my favorite stop has been Asia. All the countries. I enjoy Asia and I enjoy traveling. Mm -hmm. And who is your favorite Adams? Who is my favorite Adams? Hmm. Definitely not Pugsley. Just kidding. Well, that's all for now. If you liked what you saw here, please like and comment and tell your friends and then come back and see our next installment. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Puffy Rice or Facebook at facebook.com slash Sean Rice Actor. Oh, and if you know some interesting places that I should visit in the towns that we're headed to, please let me know down in the comments and I'd love to go check them out for you. Ta-ta for now.